understood and actionable so people can take away bits and pieces and actually apply them to their life. It's not like my life started 10 years ago, but 10 years ago I was like, oh man, I'm a complete loser. We are not buying another pillow in this house. We do not need seasonal decorations. It is fine without them. We started in Rome and ended in Barcelona, which are two of my favorite cities. So I was like, oh, so that was fun. A good way to kick it off. I have Chris McKern as a guest today. Her story is so fun because she rewrote it starting at age 50. So we get to hear about the birthday party that changed everything, the career path that she decided to pursue, how she makes decisions, and all the fun things that have happened in her life as she celebrated her 60th birthday this year and what she plans to do going forward. So if you're looking for a little inspiration and empowerment, this is your episode. Here comes Chris. Okay, everybody, today I have Chris McCarran as a guest. Chris, thank you for joining us. Jen, thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited. I'm so excited to have you. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your career today, and then we're going to back into who you were before and how we got here. It's so complicated. Can I just say I'm an entrepreneur? Because like it's like, oh, okay, so I'm a real estate broker. I have a, a co-working space. I have a home improvement contracting business, a couple of podcasts, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I got a lot of hat, a lot of balls in the air and I'm having a good time. Jack of all trades. I love this. Okay. But it started like, let's go with the origin of where it all started. Boy, I, so I guess you could say, I mean, I'm 60, right? So it's not like my life started 10 years ago, but 10 years ago, I was like, oh man, I'm a complete loser. I'm going to be 50. And oh, oh, but I was, I was, I was, okay. I'm living in a house as a 50 year old woman living in a house with five other people, like a dorm room, practically. There were two couples, another single person, <clears throat> all of them under the age of 30. They were probably under the age of 25 actually. And then here I am like the, you know, the cub, cub mother, whatever, the den mother. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, at least you can laugh about it now. Okay. So you're the den mom at age 50. And then all of a sudden something you woke up and what shifted? Well, it was my 50th birthday. So I was like, you know, having, I had three solid weeks of like, oh my God, I'm a complete loser. Oh, I can't believe I'm doing this at 50. And now it's too late to do anything else. Right. Really. I think, I hope I'm not alone. I mean, I hope I am alone in that feeling, but, but then it's actually today was my aunt, is it today the 11th? No, tomorrow. So it, my aunt is, I'm turning 50, my aunt is turning 100. And I walk into her birthday party and there she is. Like, you would have thought she was like in her 60s. You walk in there, she's got a tiara. They've given her like a sash, 100th birthday. She's greeting everyone as they come in. And she's like, oh, she knows everybody's name. So my dad is one of 10. And so I have so many aunts and uncles and cousins and people, I don't know who they are. They just wander around, you know, because as they grow up, right, you don't even recognize them anymore. And she knows everyone. She knows their birthday. She's saying to her sister, who is now I'm um, going to be 90, she's saying to her sister, oh, right, that's Brianna. She's, you know, her birthday is March 15th and she's got that and she's married to so-and-so and they have these kids. And I'm just like, oh, really? Is that's Brianna? Oh, she looks so different, you know? <laughs> And I thought, all of a sudden, I'm like standing there, I'm looking at her. And first I'm like, wow, she's really cool. And then I'm like, wait, oh my God, you have 50 more years. You have 50 more years to get your act together. So thank goodness. I love it. Those These aha moments, right? The aha moments that come out of just random sequencing of events that allow the perfect timing to say, okay. I'm not living this story anymore. There's a new truth. There is a new way. And this new way is going to look entirely different. So it was your birthday and her birthday. And so then what was the next step? Because it's one thing to become aware, but it's another thing to actually do something because a lot of us get stuck in between awareness and doing. It's true. And I think you have to figure out why you are living the, your current reality and mine was 100% shortage mentality, 100%. Because, you know, I mean, we both know people who have gotten into real estate investing with no money, no nothing, you know, just like the really strong desire to do that. And I, so my first step was like, you have got to move out of this house. <laughs> you have got to get your own place and not be, you know, renting from these people. 
And, uh, and so I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And I started just talking to people and I found somebody cause I, at that time my credit was horrible. So I couldn't go out and just buy a place from a normal bank and stuff. So I started talking to friends and people and say, I I've got to move out of this house. I'm going to buy a place and da da da. So a friend of mine said, okay, I will, I'll be the, co- I'll be your co-signer. I agree to be your co-signer. And I was like, oh, great. So I had the down payment and we found this place. It was, you know, not in wonderful condition, but it was a foreclosure. And I ended up buying a single family house for $50,000. Wow. Yeah. Right. But it was like, and, and the weird thing was that it was in a good location. It was near the public transportation. It was near the beach. It was just had all these things going for it, but for whatever reason, it just hadn't sold. And they actually, we actually, it's a long story, but I offered them 60,000, but in the end I ended up getting it for 50. So, okay. Well, the stars aligned on that one. Yeah. Don't kick a gift horse in the mouth is what they say there. That's amazing. Okay. So at location, so you had a friend willing to co-sign you buy your first, is it the first time you've ever bought a home? No, no, but it was the first time in, in many years, many years. Okay. So first time in many years that you're a, a home buyer again. And then, then what happens? Okay. This is good stuff. We got to get the details, right? Well, so I've, the place was a wreck as you can imagine, right? A Boston area home for $50,000, you know, the roof's leaking and there's all kinds of, but when I walked into that place, I was like, wow, I just saw it done. I saw what it looked like when it was done, which has always been a little bit of a gift of mine. And so I just went to work. I, I spent the first weekend gutting it, taking down all the walls, everything right down to the studs, even the interior walls, because I had this idea of making, it was a small place. So I wanted vaulted ceilings, blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> yeah, ripped it all down in the first uh, weekend, basically. And then set to work mostly by myself at that point, putting everything back together. Uh, obviously, I had to hire a plumber and an electrician because well, I, when we went, the, the bank owned it, so they wouldn't let us test anything. So when I got in there and <clears throat> started, you know, we turn you turn the water on, and of course, there's like raining in the basement. <laughs> like, I'm like, guess they've had some frozen pipes here, you know. <laughs> so, so all new plumbing, all new electrical, new roof, all kinds of uh, basically everything. But I did the insulating and the a lot of the sheetrock work, and all, of course, all the design, and and um, yeah, moved everything around, did everything. But for a long time, for like the first. I don't know. I want to say like six or nine months. I was living in one room in the back, which was the kitchen, but I was turning it into the bedroom. So there was the there was the oven, <laughs> there was a futon. <laughs> okay, now tell like so I'm listening to this story, right? And I'm sitting here thinking, how did you keep your momentum and your joy and your were was there ever a point where you just wanted to take a match and burn the place down? Oh, many times, many times, especially because the basement flooded all the time. And so like the first day, I, I, the first, I don't know, there was a, there was a washer dryer in the basement and it was like the first couple of days I was like, okay, I've got, I've got my own washing machine. I'm going to do some laundry. And I go down the stairs and my slipper is now covered in a foot of water. I'm like, oh shit, the basement's flooded. <laughs> because it wasn't that it was, it, it was the water table. So even though we, it didn't, it wasn't raining right that moment, it, the water table had gone up. And so, Hey, there was water in the basement. And I was like, so how did you fix that problem? Uh, they had a, a sort of a crude sump pump system, but it was sitting on the floor. So basically you had to already have a foot of water before the thing would turn on. So I had to, you know, you dig a hole, you put the thing in the hole and yeah, it was just, um, not complicated, but just lots of little annoyances, but you're right. Like keeping your positive mental attitude through all this drama and, and just like, well, you're paying for the drama, right? I mean, that's the harder part is like, I bought this drama. I'm living in this drama. I don't have a break from the drama because it's my home. And to still be able to, I, I mean, that's just a different level of resilience. I don't think a lot of people understand. <laughs> it's true. It's like, why is it again that you moved out of your dead mother situation? <laughs> At least I had my own working bathroom and there was no water around the washing machine. Yeah. 
Well, and there's someone you can call when there's a problem. I mean, there's a beauty to having somebody that you could call and versus you having to be responsible to fix it or get it fixed and vet all the people and do all the things. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Vet vetting the people, that's a whole other thing. Working with contractors is a joy of its own. <laughs> so, yeah, no, thank you. There's a reason why the general contractors exist. I, I mean, I... I just have learned that myself because you, you tell yourself, oh, there's just this little small thing that needs to be fixed on the house. I'm just going to call somebody and then we're going to figure it out. And then they want half up front, which you're like, okay, that makes logical sense. And then you spend the next X number of months trying to chase the human down that said they would do X thing. And I mean, it is, it's a thing. It's a, it's a thing. Oh, it's definitely a thing. Absolutely. A lot of hard lessons there. <laughs> wow. All right. So you, okay. 50th birthday, we buy this house. It is a six to nine month project, which what I'm hearing you talk about sounds like a lot longer, but I believe you if it's only six to nine months. That was how long I was living in that little bedroom, in that little bedroom slash kitchen situation. Eventually I was able to move out of the bedroom slash kitchen situation, or actually I was able to move the kitchen forward into where you would expect to find a kitchen um, and out of the bedroom, which was a good thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. And what are you doing during this time for an income? I'm a real estate agent. I was a real estate agent. So you're still selling properties and doing all the pieces. Yeah. Funny how the universe kind of just helps you along because up to that point when I was living in my, you know, with, with everybody, I was mostly doing rentals. That's what the agency did was rentals. And then all of a sudden, all these sales opportunities started coming in. And suddenly now I'm selling property instead of renting it. And that, of course, is an order of magnitude difference in, in that in many ways, not just the financial realm, but also, you know, how easy it is, how fun it is, you know? So I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, I like this because not only, I mean, you moved homes and then you also moved within your field to a different, you had a lot of transition going on. I mean, 50 was a big transitional year for you. And when you started getting into home sales, tell us about that experience, because that's a, different level of commitment, a different type of buyer and a different type of person that you're working with. And now with lending and title and all these different pieces that play into it. Yeah. And I had some experience with that from buying and selling my own property, but still the, the uh, brokerage that I was working for, they were a boutique agency that specialized in rentals. And I actually got some pushback from the broker. I'm like, you know, these people, they, they want to buy or rent. So it seems like it's a great time for them to buy and blah, blah. And he's like, we have a niche here. We're going to be doing rentals. And I said, hmm. So I just kind of like quietly sold them a house and then brought him like a really giant commission check. And he was like, oh, well, you know, there could be something to be said for sales. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> I like it. Do then ask for permission. Listen, this is how it's going to work. Show them the sugar and then keep delivering. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, but you also have other businesses. So talk about how the evolution of those came about. The the most interesting one and the most diverse from what I'm doing is this co-working space. And that was so when I was living across the street from the beach, eventually I sold that place, used the money to buy two more and you know, one of them to live in, one of them to rent and then kept doing that. And <clears throat> the, the next place I had was right on the beach. And so every morning I would go across the street and I would walk on the beach. And that was such a meditative time for me that I got all these kind of like, you know, it's quiet, you've got the surf and it's just a time when you can, it's, it's almost like meditating. It's maybe even better for me than meditating. And so I would get these little like voices, like little nudges, little things. And, and when I, I had made a, I had made a goal of earning, of making $250,000. So I had this $250,000 goal and I, took $2.50 and put it in a red bag and hung it from a jade tree that I had. And I was just, I kind of just like <laughs> gave it like little magic things. And anyway, well, I'm going to interrupt you because I, at the time, what were you making? So what was the increase to get to 250,000? Well, I didn't want to earn it that way. I wanted it to be just like magical delivery, right? I just wanted it to come to me in a big lump sum. Important details. Important detail. That, and that is important. So I was, uh, I had just got off the phone with a friend of mine about an hour before saying to him that the house that I was in right then, which was, uh, which was, it started a single family. I turned it into a two family and was making money on the other side with Airbnb <clears throat> and life was pretty good, right? That paid all my bills plus some, and plus I'm doing my, my real estate thing. 
And I just got off the phone with a friend saying, you know, I'm almost completely done with this renovation. All I have to do is paint a couple of doors and then it's done. An hour later, the phone rings. Someone says, hi, you know, my name's so-and-so. Would you like to sell your house? I'm like, seriously? (laughs) I just, you know, like, are you kidding? I just finished it. So we sat down, had a conversation, and it turned out that they were buying the house next door. So in addition to the lot that my house was on, I had three very useless lots behind me that weren't buildable. You know, they were just there. They came with it, whatever. And he was buying the place next door, which was uh, an apartment building. He wanted to expand. And so he needed the lots ne- the lots that were behind me. And he was willing to buy the house because it was a good rental income. And so I, I said to myself, well, you know, I don't even care if I sell it, right? I just finished it. I love living at the beach. It's all really good. And so I gave him a number that I felt was fair, but it wouldn't have been fair to anyone else because they would have just wanted the house, but he actually needed the land. So I had to add an order of magnitude or not, not an order of magnitude. I had to add something for the land. And so it ended up being that after about a year after I hung that little bag from my jade tree, I had actually had a profit of about 500,000. So it was like, yeah, exactly. Woo-hoo! I know. And so before, when I hung up the phone with him, before we had our meeting, I was like, if I sell this place, what am I going to do? And so I started looking around online and I found this commercial space about an hour from the beach, about an hour from my current, the life that I had right then. That was, and right in the, right in the notes, the agent had said, would make an excellent WeWork style co-working space. And I was like, Ooh, and I got this little tingle on the back of my neck. I'm like, oh, I, I have to buy that. So that's that's why I'm here in the middle of, not nowhere, but in the middle of a small town <laughs> running a co-working space. <laughs> wow. And so have you always been able to listen to your intuition or is that a muscle that you developed or when do you know to follow it and when do you know not to follow it? You know, it's so interesting that you asked me that because sometimes you think, oh, is this my inner voice talking? But it isn't. It's some other little evil demon sitting on the wrong shoulder. And I asked, I I interviewed somebody for my podcast one time and she said, oh, and I just listened to my guardian angel. And I'm like, how do you know that it's your guardian angel and not someone else? And she's like, oh, I ask it to repeat things three times. And I was like, that's interesting. I don't have that like you know, contract with my little inner voice. So when I was walking on the beach, it really was pretty much always the good voice. But now that I'm not doing that every day, I'm so lost sometimes. I'll be like, is this the good the good angel or the bad angel? Is this, you know, should I be listening to this? And sometimes I'll go with something and it'll turn out to not be a great idea at all. But as Tony Robbins and probably a lot of other people say, right, everything's happening for us, not to us. So we just go with it, right? It's all going to be good in the end. <laughs> wow. Okay. So how's the co-working? Like, how was that during COVID? I didn't own it yet during COVID. I just actually finished working on it um, this March. So March was when it opened. Oh, so it's brand new. Yeah. I sold my place in 2022. So yeah. So that this is all kind of a new adventure and it's, it's doing okay, but I, did not realize that people in this area had never heard of co-working. So that was a whole like, what, you know, oh, I, I said, oh, I opened a co-working space. Oh, what's that? And I was like, oh no, all my advertising <laughs> talks about this being a co-working space. No, no, what it is. Oh my God. So yeah, there's been a whole educational process to uh, lots of events and stuff to get people in, to get them to understand what it is. And it's, it's building momentum and it's, it's fun. It's fun. So a good diversion for now. So I live in Park City, Utah. I, I didn't catch where you are in the world right now. Uh, right now I'm in Tingsboro, Mass, which is about an hour north of Boston. Okay. And they opened a, a co-working space here. And I thought they named it the kiln. So I thought for some reason it was like somewhere where you made pottery. And I just had never gone in. I mean, I don't know. It just that the name, it was a weird building, whatever. And then they had an event there. So event marketing is definitely good. So they had an event there and I went inside. I was like, wow, this place is amazing. Are you kidding me? They had a little kitchen and snacks and you could have a a conference room, a podcast room, a little office space. And for a lot of people that are this entrepreneur, solopreneur nowadays, 
it gave you this social outlet of connecting and seeing what everybody's doing and just feel like you're involved in things that are bigger than yourself. I absolutely loved it. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And that's what exactly what we're doing here. I mean, the, the sort of the competitors around here are like Barnes and Noble or Panera or something where you're going to go there and you're just going to put your head down and you're going to work on your stuff. And there's no opportunity for you to interact with other people unless you're going to walk up to someone else's table and say, hi, I see that you're in here a lot. And they'll be like, oh, creepy vibe, you know? And yeah, but we introduce people to each other when they're new, like, oh, hi, meet so-and-so. And, and, and they're between the events and the coffee machine and, you know, being in the kitchen and whatever, you just meet people organically that can become friends and, and coworkers and, you know, friends and clients and things like that. So, Yeah. No, I, and I went there, there was a photographer that I was doing some content with just to have for business looks and different things. And so she has a membership there because different parts of the building look entirely different. And so then we went in there and we took photos for an hour and had a bunch of different backdrops and angles and colors and books and all the different details that I thought, oh, wow, even being a photography type studio yet, off, I mean, it's fun to see all the different ways you can use these spaces. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So that you're turning 60 when? I actually did the 23rd of July. Woo! Happy belated birthday. Thank you. Yes. I loved like your post about like 60 is going to be the best year yet and blah, 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 blah. I think that's fantastic. So what do you have planned for your 60s that are going to allow you to say this was my best decade yet? Lots of new, you know, I love adventures and so I'm spending a lot of time planning fun travel experiences. I've been almost every weekend, I've been like outside at a concert or going to some place, like a little getaway. Like it's so easy, especially when you're an entrepreneur and you're working on businesses. Like I'm just going to, oh, I can't get away this weekend. I've got to do this. No, there's none of that. There's like, okay. That's actually something that the co-working space has given me because I'm, there's, there are weekends, right? We're not open weekends. So even though I do real estate and stuff there, there are still like defined times when it's a time to take time off. So I will be just doing fun things. And I, for my, for my actual birthday, I had never been on a cruise before and I had never been to Greece before. So I said, okay, I went on this cruise to the Greek islands in Malta, which started in Rome and ended in Barcelona, which are two of my favorite cities. So I was like, oh, so that was fun, a good way to kick it off. But now I want to go to countries I've ever been to, continents. I've never been to South America. So I have a lot of traveling to do. And so actually what I'm working on right now, I've got two interns and they, I'm having them screen the candidates for a person who's going to be here to take care of everything when I'm not here. So good for you. I know once you get that travel bug, I mean, it's hard not to feed it. It gets hungry and he just, he has ideas and more ideas and more ideas. And then you're like, okay, well, I work to fund my travel. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you wrote a couple books. Just one so far. The other one is still on my drive. The other one's still on my drive. <laughs> it's a lot. Of, it's a wrestling match. I'm in the middle of writing a book. Well, I'm actually done. The book comes out January 9th. But I mean, we're still going through copy, line edit, and all this kind of stuff. And what I thought a book writing process would be and what a book writing process is are about as foreign to each other as anything else. Yeah. Especially a nonfiction book. It's different, right? Like fiction, you just make it up and then you just, you know, can publish it theoretically. But there's, there is higher standard when you're writing a, a business-related book because people want it to have good grammar and <laughs> they want everything to flow and all the lessons to be like understood and actionable so people can take away bits and pieces and actually apply them to their life and all the little things. Yeah. And that's what I did with mine. I had somebody, <clears throat> some people read it who don't know anything about real estate. And it was interesting how they had misinterpreted certain things. And I was like, Ooh, okay, great. Got to get in there and re, re explain this again. Right. Cause it's so easy, right? The curse of knowledge, you start off at step three or step seven or 10, and you don't even re realize that you left out the, f the first few steps. This is my book, which I la later found out that the, it's not a good title. Why is it not a good title? Empower your inner millionaire of Women's Guide to Financial Freedom through Real Estate Investing, I think it's a great title. Thank you. I was told that people uh, are intimidated by the, by the word millionaire. So they'll be like, oh, I'm not a millionaire. I'm never going to be a millionaire. So they wouldn't buy the book. I'm like, maybe it's okay if those people don't buy it. 
Yeah. You're going after the people that want to be a millionaire. Thank you. At least a millionaire. There you go. I love too, because when I was reading um, some of the information that you put in for the podcast, you talked about how you waited to buy a home because the story that you had about if I buy a home, then am I marriage material, right? Am I, am I, am I all of a sudden closing down this dream of finding a husband and having a house and like doing the things in that sequential order, right? And I think it's good to talk about because so many of us have these unspoken rules in our head that are keeping us down certain paths that we have to sit and question those to have a new opportunity show up. Right. It's true. And I think, I don't think that's unusual for women. I think men maybe have an idea and this is very, I mean, I'm 60, right? So you're going to get some traditional stuff out of me, but I think men have more of an idea like, well, I'm going to be the breadwinner and I'm going to, I can, I can be a homeowner. It's okay. And then my wife will just come move here. But if it's the woman, it's like, I, I don't want, I wouldn't want to marry someone and have them come live in my house, right? I would want us to buy a house together. But so what? So you put yours up for rent or whatever, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, certainly not unsurmountable, but it's just weird. You, you have to realize you have this issue before you can fix it, right? Right, right. No, and I mean, it, and it's awareness. And there's so many little rules I think we all follow all the time. And then we find out that we're not happy, we're not being authentic to ourselves or whatever else like that, because we're not taking the time to explore the rules that we put in place for ourselves. And what does it mean if that rule is not true? Guess what? It means that I could own a house, get married and rent the home or sell the home, or there's so many more options, but it takes time to slow down and evaluate what those options are and then be able to take movement and action behind a different story. Exactly. And it's like you say, you don't, some things you just take as a truth without ever questioning them. And you, you really have to pull it out into the light and say, wait a minute, this isn't a truth. Why do I think this? Right? Right. Yeah. No, I would say traveling has probably opened my eyes to more of my subconscious truths where I, I remember being in Nepal. I was climbing a mountain. It was Halloween back at home. And so back at home, right, everybody has pillows with spiders on them and different things that are hanging in windows and kids are buying like seven costumes by the time it's actually Halloween day. And I get to Nepal and there's, I mean, the only spiders are real ones. I'm like, wait, I'm like, no, like you, right? You just forget that this is a bubble that you live in. And this is a story fable that you're telling yourselves and like playing out that the whole world works just fine without celebrating Halloween like we do. It's okay. And that was just one of those, I came home and then it was getting close to Thanksgiving and we were packing up all the Halloween. And then all of a sudden we were bringing out all the pumpkin pillows. I'm like, we are not buying another pillow in this house. We do not need seasonal decorations. It is fine without them. I'm sick of boxing and unboxing things. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Our attraction to things. And then once you start like getting rid of things, it's like, wow, that was fun. Let's get rid of some more things. No, I know. I have seven children. So let me tell you how fast things accumulate in my household where when they want to do crafts, I'm like, is it edible or is it donatable? Okay. Because if we can make the dog next door treats or you could eat whatever we're making, we're not making things that like need shelf space. We do not have shelf space for all of your creations. So we have to make edible, perishable items in this house. That's super though. It's great. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you get into real estate investing in the first place? Like where was, how did that become a pathway for you? It's sad to say, but I remember being 16 years old and laying on the floor with the newspaper and seeing real estate, three family houses for sale for like $17,000 and saying to my dad, dad, that seems like it would be a great investment. Maybe we should buy it. And he was like, are you nuts? That's in a town that, you know, you don't want to go to that town and people aren't, you know, it's like, they're all going to be drug addicts and whatever. And you're, you know, your, your tenants will be blah, blah, blah. And, and just say, oh, you know, gee. So I always, I think, wanted to do that. And various times in my life have tried to do that with no success whatsoever. When I first got married, I was like, which was, I was 22. When I first got married, I was 22. And I said to my husband, let's buy a piece of real estate. Let's buy a three family. So basically I went to that town, bought that same house, which was now literally $115,000 
because in that short amount of time, really, the, the market had just done that. And I bought probably at the very top of the market, didn't know anything, didn't ask for help, didn't do my research. And the day of the closing, the owner moved two of the tenants out to a different house because those were the only two that were paying, left me with the one that wasn't paying. And yeah, just a complete nightmare. So far over my head, did not know what I was doing. Ended up losing that house or giving it back to the bank and saying, yeah, hey. Because when I consult an attorney, he's like, this house is not worth anywhere near what you paid for it. And you have no tenants and somebody stole all the copper piping in the basement. So you've got repairs to do. So just give it back to the bank. And so I did. Totally. Yeah. Big L on the top of the head for that one. But yeah, that's hard. And it's a lesson, I think, too, and just the importance of mentorship, right? The importance of, hey, if you're going to do something in a new arena that you have no experience in, talk to people that are in that field. Yeah, I was just having a conversation with this the other day about if um, someone that called me and they were looking for some advice. They're like, hey, I'm just not getting a lot of support with the people around me and they just think I'm crazy. I said, you know, I went to climb Everest. Okay. When I went to climb Everest, my mom wasn't my first call because my mom doesn't understand what's involved. She's going to say, you're crazy. It's dangerous. Why would you do that? Like what, like what fell on your head, blah, 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 blah. I go, so to climb Everest, I needed to talk to people that have climbed Everest before. I needed to say like, okay, you did it. Let's go for a hike. I want to figure out like how strong you are, how endurance you are, like the hard parts of it, the easy parts of it. And then you start humanizing these people that climbed Everest and you're like, hey, I'm just like them. If they can do it, I can do it. And then like it just became more real. And then I went to my mom and I'm like, hey, here's what's going on. Here's people that I know that climbed it. Here's how I'm training. And just had the whole piece put together, which then gave her permission to calm her nerves and be supportive. But to expect her to be supportive right in the beginning would be crazy. And I mean, I know that I have a kid. So if I, if they came to me, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's junior, let's figure this out a little bit before we go down that road. Not that I'm not supportive. I just know where my, my mind would go is keeping them safe. And then just thinking about anything we pursue, we having people that have pursued it or understand it or know the questions to ask. Like, I remember calling a coach when I was going to go climb Everest and I said, okay, what are questions that I need to ask when I'm vetting these climbing companies? And one of the questions was, is who's the Sherpa that you're going to be climbing with? Because all the big companies have famous Sherpas that are amazing humans, but they have one or two of them. There's going to be 10 to 15 people on your team. So don't let that advertisement sell you on that company if that's not the person you're climbing with, which would be a question I wouldn't even have known to ask. So finding these mentors or finding people ahead of you in whatever pursuit you're doing is so important because it keeps us from putting the the L's on our head, or at least helps minimize the damage of them. And luckily, I mean, my mistakes only cost money, but your mistake, I mean, if you would have not done a great job, like, I can do it. I am woman. I'm going to go climb Everest and then just like set off with your, you know, your ice pick, you know, <laughs> it's like, that's dangerous. Dangerous. Right. Life-threatening. Yeah, definitely. Which, you know, sometimes those more extreme adventures make you take them more seriously which I wish we took some of our lighter hearted ones more seriously too. Because it, it's not just financial, it's emotional, right? It's, a, it's building that confidence in yourself again and saying, okay, I make good decisions. I made a bad one, which is part of the human experience, but I still make good decisions. You know what's sad though, <clears throat> is when I talk to women, oh, what do you do, blah, blah, blah. They'll be like, oh yeah, my grandfather's uncle's cousin's friend, invest in real estate and they failed. So I just don't think it's for me. And in, I mean, I do have to say about myself, I didn't say, oh, that's it. I mean, I did for a little while say, I just, I'm just not cut out to, for real estate investing. But then you say, okay, actually I did that in a dumb way. I, I didn't do my research. What can I do differently now? How can I learn from that experience to go on and do better next time? And that's, that's where the growth is, right? That's where the magic is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just having the courage to say, okay, guess what? When I dissect this into more detail, 
I can say these are good choices, these are bad choices, here's things that I can tweak or change or improve upon to make a better choice next time, and then just keep refining and refining and refining, and eventually you become an expert in XYZ field. And when you're you, you take on a whole different thing. You're like, and we're going to try this co-working space and we're going to do this. And I love that about you. That's living, that's experiencing, that's exploring, that's doing life. Yeah. I mean, growing and I, I really do get bored easily. So it's important for me to just to keep learning new stuff, doing new stuff, having new experiences. That's what keeps me alive and, you know, young and happy. Wow. I love this. Okay, so for our listeners listening in today, what is one piece of advice that you have for them should they start on their path and say, you know what? I'm not dead yet. I'm living. Here's what I should do. I mean, the easy thing is like, oh, just do it. But actually, it's like, instead of saying, oh, I've already wasted this, spent this, done this thing. So do you want to spend that same amount of time where staying where you are? Or do you actually want to evolve? So just as an example, people who I meet who are like, I'm too old to go back to school because I'm 42. Say, okay, so you want to spend the next 42 years, you know, at at this current level and not go back to school. You want to spend your next 42 years as a, a person who doesn't have a passive income stream, as a person who just knows that they haven't lived up to their own potential. I mean, we were at Tanglewood the other day, which is like a music venue, watching John Williams, who is... 90 years old, conducting his songs that he wrote, or, or you know, his music that he wrote for Star Wars and the Olympics and all the kind of stuff. He looked fantastic. He was, because he, he's so loving what he's doing. He's still doing the things that bring him joy. And that otherwise, I mean, you know, to quote like Meatloaf, right? If you, you, you're only killing time and it'll kill you right back, just go and enjoy every single second and assume you never have to stop working because it feels like fun. It feels like, play. And that was a long winded answer. No, no, no. I like it though. It's good. And it's just allowing yourself to do life and let it look a lot of different ways than maybe what you originally thought, but that's kind of the beauty of it. Yay. All right. So how do people find you to learn more about your story and all the good things you're bringing to the world? You have a podcast. I have I have two podcasts. If you're interested in real estate investing, you can listen to Women Creating Wealth, which is all about women and real estate investing. And then there's Get Your Phil podcast, which is Phil is financial independence and long life because I'm a little too old to retire early. So that <laughs> I replace fire with Phil. And But chrismccarron.com is my website. And you can if, if you work hard enough, you can get to everywhere else from there. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Thank you so much for your time today, Chris. Jen, thank you so much. It was so great talking to you. Take care.